Good morning, everyone. I hope all are doing well. There was a, a couple that went to Israel. They brought their mother-in-law with them. And the mother-in-law died while in Israel. They went to a caretaker and the caretaker said, two options. We can bury your mom here in Israel for $150 or send her to the States. That would be $5,000. Think about it, let me know. The man thought for just a few moments and said, well, let's send her back to the States. Sir, I don't understand, the caretaker said. $5,000 back to the States, but $150 here in Israel? And the man responded and said, well, 2,000 years ago, a man died and rose again from the dead, and I don't want to take any chances. I love mother-in-laws. God bless you. Let's get into this message this morning. Howard Hendricks is a uh, former professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He was flying from Dallas to, excuse me, from Boston to Dallas. And on the plane was an unruly passenger. He observed a stewardess handling the situation with such peace and gentleness. And afterwards, he complimented her and said, you know, you represent your airlines really well. And without hesitation, she said, sir, I don't represent the airlines. I represent the Lord Jesus Christ. The title of my message is Sent, the Toughest Assignment You Will Ever Love. Well, I do fly quite a bit, and I was catching a plane from Charlotte to Sarasota. A seven-hour delay. I was on the tarmac for two hours. It was a difficult time to be in the airport with a lot of passengers that were either angry or frustrated and tired. I was in the Admiral's Club and observed a server helping people and doing all he could to, to uh, serve them. And so I said to him as he passed by, you are the Michael Jordan of the Admiral's Club. And he loved that. And so he said out loud, he just said, I'm the Michael Jordan of the Admiral's Club. And everyone kind of laughed. Well, the man next to me heard it as well. And he said, thank you for sharing that with him. I struck up a conversation with this man and uh, he shared with me many things. I said, where are you from? He says, well, I'm from Pennsylvania. I have a sawmill, but I'm also from Venice, Florida, where I have a, a potato farm south of Venice. But I'm sad because my sawmill just burned down $5 million worth of damage. And every part of his conversation, he used the word broke and broken. And I listened to him, broken family, broken employees, broken community. It was a tough time for him. And we shared back and forth intermittently with a few questions. I also shared with him the fact that uh, in the culture of Japan, they take ceramic that has been broken that has no use whatsoever. And they remold it and they fill the cracks with gold. And eventually that ceramic becomes beautiful and useful. And it's the story of redemption. And I prayed for him. Actually, I spoke the prayer. I said, I pray that God would redeem your situation. He has that ability. In the middle of the conversation, he says, oh, my daughter wants me to know God. It was time to catch a flight, and I knew I had shared everything I possibly could with the man about the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, I need to go now. If you want to pray to ask God to be the healer and leader of your life, you know, like the captain of a ship, come find me, and I'll be in line at gate B3. And I left that man and prayed while I did. The theme, toughest assignment you'll ever love, actually comes from a Peace Corps mantra that came after it was established in 1961. But I've changed the word from job, which was the original toughest job you'll ever love, to the word assignment, the toughest assignment you'll ever love. The Peace Corps was effective because volunteers were sent as ambassadors of peace and hope. It was effective because volunteers were empowered by a higher authority that opened doors. It was effective because volunteers love what they did, although it was a tough assignment. And there's no greater assignment in all the world than knowing that we've been sent by God. 
We've been empowered by God. And well, quite frankly, we love what we do. John 4, or 3, 34 and 35 says, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. Wow. Jesus sent by God. The word sent is actually mentioned 21 times in the book of John. John 20, 21 says, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then actually in verse 22, the Bible says that he breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. It was a commissioning service. He was sending them. John 14, uh, 24 and 25 says, but I am telling you, what I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. His words, his authority, and his flow in life came from this incredible relationship with the Holy Spirit sent by God. John 12, uh, 44 and 45 says, if you trust me, you are trusting not only in me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. Sent by God, a sense of sentness, John 7, 6, 16 and 19 says, my teaching is not from me, but from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know about my teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak from my own authority. The person who speaks on his own authority desires to receive honor for himself. The one who desires the honor of the one who sent him is a man of integrity and there is no unrighteousness in him. The idea of being sent by God was the toughest assignment that Jesus ever could love. He was sent by God to do his bidding. Well, let me give you an example of what this means. In the book of Nehemiah, there's the story of a broken man called of God to rebuild the gates and walls of Jerusalem. He hears the story, he mourns and he fasts, and now is with the king, whereby he's the cupbearer. The king notices his countenance and inquires, Nehemiah, you seem so sad, what's wrong? And after explaining why he was sad, after all his beloved Jerusalem was in, Jeruz it was in ruins, the king not only asks how he can help, the king provides a letter for Nehemiah that provides safe passage through various countries and passageways. The king also provides a letter to Asaph, who's the manager of, of a forest full of cedar. So Nehemiah can select cedar for the walls and the gates. The king provides a guard for Nehemiah for safe travel and provides a house for when he arrives in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was sent by the king. And we will see later in Nehemiah that as he built the walls and the gates, he was harassed. Sanballat tried to discourage him, shame him, and oppose him. Well, what was the difference in all of this as Nehemiah responded to that? How does he handle it? Well, you know what? Nehemiah was sent by a king. He had a letter of the king that gave him authority and that is what Jesus is attempting to say for himself and to us. We are sent by God to do his bidding and we have a letter written on our hearts. Well, what must we learn, must we learn from this idea of sentness? I would suggest two things. Speak your story and live your story. Think about it. How do you communicate the gospel? How is the gospel communicated to you? Was it clear? Have we lived in a, a bubble of Christian language and methodology for so long that when we communicate outside the bubble, people say, wait, what? A coffee shop owner I recently met told me that one of his employees began working and had never really been outside the bubble of church life and realized his language was so well churchy. His fellow employers did not relate to him at all. In other words, he needed to be real with people, authentic. And I want us to go to class this morning and ask the question, how did Jesus communicate? 
This is what we know. We know that Jesus spent most of his time in the marketplace. We know that uh, we know what we know is that the majority of discourse in the in the Gospels are answers to questions he asked. And we also know that two thirds of the miracles that Jesus performed were in the marketplace as well, not a temple, if you will, not a church. So how do we communicate? Leonard Sweet in his book, Giving Blood, shares many ideas, but I wanna share four. Jesus spoke in metaphors. He used the language of gardener and nets. Pictures can be understood by many people. Aristotle said, and I love this, the soul never thinks without a mental image. And he also said, metaphor consists in giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. Jesus compared himself to bread and to light and to vine because it was something people of his day understood. An image was created. And I know across the broad sweeping canopy of grapevines in Chile, where I've lived, you can see vines and grapes. It was much how, how Jesus experienced himself, how Israel is in some places even today. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. This is what, what Jesus says in John 15. I am the vine and you are the branches, but you're joined with me and I with you. The relation intimate and organic. The harvest is sure to be abundant, separated. You can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood gathered up and thrown in the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. His disciples understood the, the imagery because it was their way of life. Many were farmers of a vineyard. And I would imagine that there's imagery all around us as well that we can see and we can use to help communicate this person of Jesus Christ. Jesus also used similes. A simile is a literary device that makes a comparison between two, two things using words like using words like or as. The kingdom of heaven is like, and as he would say this, his disciples would s sit on edge and, and try to decipher what was going to come next. They, he communicated. He caused his listeners to, to sit up and take place. At one point, Jesus attempting to communicate a tough word said, you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 52, then you, then you see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store. I love that. Who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. Jesus used questions as well. He asked questions to see if his disciples were getting it, and his disciples asked questions for clarifications as well. They asked about the parable of the sower. They wanted to know the difference between clean and unclean. Jesus engaged in conversation by asking questions. Something I've learned along the way, for example, is that instead of asking people what they do, I ask, where are you from? Everyone likes to talk about where they are from. It's a comfortable question. It's easier to talk about what you do and it, because what you do, can be, what you do can be cumbersome and many people are unhappy in what they do. Finally, Jesus was a storyteller. French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said, a man is always a teller of tales. He lives surrounded by his stories and the stories of others. He sees everything that happens to, to him and through him. And he tries to live his own life as if he were telling a story. Jesus was a master storyteller. He provided for the listener an image, a picture. German philosopher Andreas Feinhanger said, in contrast to the spoken and written word, a picture can be understood anywhere in the world it can bridge the chasm created by differences of language and alphabet. 
It is by means, it's a means for universal communication. It's the language of the world, pictures. And I really believe this is true as I've traveled now in 1996 different countries. I can tell you that telling stories and making and creating images and pictures in the minds of people helps to communicate the gospel. This is how Jesus communicated. Just recently, a, a person that I'm discipling called me with a little frustration. He told me that he was reading the book of Luke and John because I'd give him an assignment to read Luke and John and to make note of the leadership qualities of Jesus. So he calls me up frustrated and says, all I see is Jesus telling stories. I see narration. I see him healing people coming alongside people, but I don't see leadership qualities. I smiled and responded by simply saying, Josh, you're nailing it, bro. This is who Jesus was. He was the ultimate storyteller. You are looking for leadership qualities that relate to the business world that are perhaps in your head, but not here. Jesus was entirely different and his method changed the world. The toughest assignment you'll ever love is the growth track to learning and understanding how Jesus communicated. But we ask the question, what about living your story? Well, 2 Corinthians 8.21 says, we are careful to be honorable before the Lord, but we also want everyone else to see that we are honorable. And Luke 6.31 says, do to others as you would like them to do to you. Listen now to the story that's a real fresh story that uh, I heard first from firsthand knowledge. An 11 year old little league catcher named Cohen Becknell demonstrated this recently in a championship game at Lakewood Ranch, Florida. With two outs, score tied and a man on third base, Cohen's team needed one more out for the game to proceed to extra innings. The opposing team's batter hit a ground ball to the shortstop who quickly threw the ball to Cohen who was ready to take the runner out at home plate as he was coming from third base. The umpire yelled, out! And the crowd roared as the game would go to extra innings. However, simultaneously, Cohen looked up at the ump and said, ump, I dropped the ball. And the umpire then loudly declared, safe! And the opposing team won the championship game. Were they playing a baseball game, working in the marketplace or leading in a local church, a priority must be living right. Honesty and a credible witness won the game. This is living the story. John 8, 28 and 29 says, but you have lifted up, when you have lifted up the son of man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the father taught me and the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus is sending us to the Little League field. You know, if there was ever a time that America or the world needed a timely message with authority, it would be now. A message from someone sent from God. Divine miracles, supernatural manifestations, or or unmistakable blessings, normally include the presence of someone sent from God, sent the toughest assignment you'll ever love. Little league game, airport weather delay, marketplace on an airplane. I challenge you today to be storytellers as Jesus did. I challenge you to be a story that causes people to think. You know, if the Peace Corps volunteers were sent as ambassadors of peace and hope, all the more we are sent by God to be messengers of hope and peace. If Peace Corps volunteers were empowered by a higher authority which opened doors for them, all the more we are empowered from on high with a loving, redeeming God. If Peace Corps volunteers love what they did and it was a tough job for them, all the more you and I must consider the toughest assignment we'd ever love. Oh, by the way, You might be wondering about what happened to that man in the airport. I'd listened to the story and I, I'd listened to his story and I knew where where he was from. 
it was time to catch a flight. And I said, I need to go now. If you want to pray to ask God to be the healer and leader of your life, you know, like the captain of a ship, come find me. I'll be in line at gate B3. And I left that man and prayed while I did. The airport was crowded with angry and frustrated people. I myself had waited more than seven hours in the airport, waiting on the tarmac for two hours. It was raining outside, delayed border, uh, boarding announcements. And I finally arrived at 2.30 in the morning. And then someone tapped me on the shoulder. It was my new friend. And he said, I want to pray. Will you pray for me? I asked, well, what do you want me to pray? He said, I want to accept the God that you've talked about. <clears throat> In my mind, I said, God, we got one. In Charlotte, North Carolina, at gate B3, in a packed terminal with angry, tired, and frustrated travelers all around. We prayed together, and this man asked the God of heaven to be his Lord and Savior. I conclude this morning with an unquenchable passion for the lost. I have a couple of questions. What if we communicated differently? What if we lived differently? What if we took some time to study how Jesus communicated? What if there is even one person right now in our sphere of influence that needs to see and hear the gospel in a different way? Speak the story. Live the story. Scent the toughest assignment that you'll ever love. God bless you.